It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I know you all have had a chance to see Three Minutes of Lengthening, an extraordinary film for the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival for 2022. And it is my pleasure to introduce our panel today. Uh, we have quite a distinguished group. I'm gonna start with Bianca Stichter, uh, who is the director, producer, and writer. And uh, Bianca is joining us from Amsterdam. Um, she's a historian and a culture critic. Uh, she's made this uh, short film essays, uh, including three minutes, 13 minutes, 30 minutes in 2014. I Kiss This Letter, Farewell Letters from Amsterdam of 2018. And she's an associate producer of Steve McQueen's feature film, 12 Years a Slave and Widows. In 2019, Bianca published the book, Atlas of an Occupied City, Amsterdam, 1940 to 1945. So Bianca from Amsterdam, welcome uh, to our conversation. I will Thank also you. bring uh, Katerina Vartenia, uh, the editor of the film from Paris. So this is quite a global conversation. Uh, Katerina has edited documentaries and feature films for over 20 years, among which Brownian Movement of 2010, It's Also Quiet in 2013, Cobain 2018, and Robbie Mueller Living in the Light in 2018. She won a golden calf at the Netherlands Film Festival for her work, It's Also Quiet, and as I said, she lives and works in Paris. So Katerina, so glad to have you today. And then of course, Glenn Kurtz, who's coming to us from New York, uh, is the author of Three Minutes in Poland, Discovering a Lost World in a 1938 family film, which is of course the basis of uh, the film. Um, it was selected as best book of 2014 by the New Yorker, the Boston Globe, and National Public Radio. Uh, Glenn is also the author of Practicing, A Musician's Return to Music. And from 20, 2008 to 2015, he hosted Conversations on Practice about the writing process in a writer's life. And he interviewed uh, everyone from Patti Smith and Jennifer Egan to Martin Amos and Adam Gopnik. Um, and in 2016, Glenn was a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow um, and from 2019 to 2021, a Presidential Fellow at Chapman University in Orange, California. So Bianca, Katerina and Glenn, we're so pleased to have you here today and thank you uh, both for your work in the film uh, and of course for uh, contributing to this year's Atlanta Jewish Film Festival. So we'll dig right into our conversation. Um, and Glenn, I'm going to start with you, because in some ways you're sort of the beginning. Um, you found the film reel in the corner of your parents' closet in Palm Beach Gardens in 2009. And it was a home movie entitled Our Trip to Holland, Belgium, Poland, Switzerland, France, and England, 1938. Um, and I believe it was taken by your grandfather, David Kurtz. Could you talk a little bit about that film and the discovery process? That's right. Yeah, you said that I was the beginning, but really, I guess it was my grandfather who was the beginning, right. or my grandparents. Um, they were both born in Poland in the 1880s, came to the U.S. as small children uh, with their families. So they grew up very much American. And then at some point in the 1930s, sort of having made good in America, they, they did their grand tour of Europe. They went to Amsterdam, um, among other places, and uh, took this side trip to visit my grandfather's hometown of Nashelsk in Poland. Um, and it was just a, a tip, a tourist trip. They went for pleasure. They went for their own enjoyment. And I think that this film was just kind of a souvenir, a bit of a novelty that my grandfather made. And when it came home, I don't know, maybe they watched it, maybe they showed it to their friends. I don't know what happened to it, other than ultimately it sat in a closet for 70 years. And no one ever thought that it was anything other than grandma and grandpa's vacation footage. Um, and then in, 20, in 2009, when I stumbled across it, I saw that title. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know about this trip. I didn't know where they had gone. Um, I never met my grandfather who died before I was born. Um, so when I first saw it, the only thing that I knew about it was what was contained in the title, that they had gone to these places and it was in 1938. But just seeing Poland, 1938, together in a sentence, 
made me realize that this was something of extraordinary importance. And as soon as I watched the footage, I knew I had to save it. And I knew that I wanted to try to understand what we were looking at and that specifically, not in general. I knew it was Poland. I knew it was 1938, but I wanted to know who these people were and what had become of them in particular. Well, and it's an extraordinary glimpse into pre-war uh, European life and Jewish life. And, and we'll talk about that as, uh, as we go through the conversation. So of course you discover it, um, right? And Bianca and Katerina, um, can you talk about how you got involved in the project, how you came to know Glenn and how you all came together as a team? Well, I was uh, in two thousand end of 2014, I was scrolling on um, Facebook <laughs> and I saw this um, post come up uh, that was called Three Minutes in Poland. And I think, yeah, the, the algorithm of Facebook made me, made me see this. And the title was for me very intriguing, Three Minutes in a, in a Country, but what is this? So I clicked on it. And it was, I think, about the book that Glenn published about his grandfather's film. And it also said that you could watch this um, footage on the website of the Holocaust Museum in Washington. So uh, my curiosity was piqued and I watched it there and I was immediately um, mesmerized by it for a part because it was very vibrant in color. And for us, um, you know, 1938 is mostly in, in black and white. Mm -hmm. So it being in color and seeing all those children really looking at us brought it very, um, gave it a kind of immediacy that um, most films, if they exist from that time, didn't have. And then immediately I had the feeling, oh, three minutes is so short, couldn't we make it longer to to keep these people in the present for longer than those uh, short um, three minutes. But being more of a historian and a writer than a filmmaker, I didn't follow up this thought until the Rotterdam Film Festival asked me um, to make a short video essay because I was working as a film critic as well mm -hmm. as that time. And I said, yes, but the film I really would like to work with is this um, found footage, three minutes in Poland by David um, Kurtz. And they um, said, okay, go ahead and do it. So I contacted uh, Glenn who was um, um, interested, but also a bit cautious, like who is this lady from Amsterdam who out of the blue sends me an email and wants to do something with this footage, but um, I wrote him a long letter and I think I convinced him to, to come along on this um, journey and he made it happen that we got access to the footage from the Holocaust Museum and then we made a short um, version in 2015 that was shown in Rotterdam on the festival and then I still had the feeling we were not ready that the material could still yield um, more, so I wanted to make it even longer than those 30 minutes I was striving for, for an hour. And then I looked for a producer, and then with the producer, we looked for uh, editors, and that's when Katerina uh, came along on the journey. So Katerina, can you talk about how you got involved? I was just called by the producer and Bianca, and we had a meeting, and they told me about this project and I was immediately very interested because the idea of making an hour from three minutes of rushes seemed really uh, different from what I'm used to, especially with documentaries, it's always tens of hours of rushes. So three minutes, I thought, yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> and, um, and also the book, I read the book, of Glenn Kurtz, so um, so I was really uh, really I, I thought it was extremely nice to do that, and that's how I was in, involved. 
I want to excuse my bad English, by the way, but... You're doing a terrific job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Glenn, you find the reel, um, you watch the reel. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you became involved with the United States uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum? Sure. Well, when I found the film, it was in terrible condition. It was actually not playable. Um, um, it had shrunk and kind of fused together into a, like a single mass. It was like a hockey puck. Um, so what I watched originally was actually a VHS copy that had been made sometime in the early 80s. That was probably the last time the film had been projected. And it was in such bad condition, um, I knew that the original had to be preserved. I didn't have the expertise or the resources to do it. And what's more, I knew that it had historical significance. So I searched around for places that would be able not only to restore it, but to make it available to a larger public. Um, and the US Holocaust Memorial Museum was you know, far and away the best, the best place to put it. Um, and I met there with uh, Leslie Swift, who's now the director of the um, film oral history and I think recorded sound division. I'm not sure exactly the name of the, the title of the department, um, but she was wonderful and they were very excited. So my grandparents actually shot 14 minutes of film all together um, on their trip to Europe, of which just these three minutes are in Poland. So that's all the footage there is of Poland. It's not an excerpt of a longer film about Poland. It's an excerpt of a longer film of their vacation. But those three minutes are the only three minutes. And I thought they'd only be interested in that part, but no, they were interested in all of it. So they restored it and put it up on the internet, which is, I think, eventually how Bianca saw it. And it's also how some of the most amazing discoveries that the film ultimately led to. Um, took place because my goal originally was to make it available to a larger public because there's hundreds of people in this, in this film. And this was a town of approximately 3,000 Jews out of say 4,500 people. And by the end of the war of those 3,000 when my grandparents visited, fewer than 100 were still alive. And I, and I knew that if I was going to be able to try to understand really what was happening, I would have to try and find, if possible, a survivor or someone who was the child of a survivor or someone who had left the town before the war and could be my guide to this, this town and to this footage. Um, and ultimately that is in fact what happened. Well, it, again, it's an extraordinary deep dive into kind of pre-war um, you know, European life. Uh, remind the audience of the dates of uh, your grandparents' trip. Um, well, they were, it was in the summer of 1938. It actually took me a couple of years before I was able to say for certain exactly what the dates were, but they left um, at the end of July. I think it was July 24th. And they came back to New York on September 5th. So that was Labor Day, Monday, September 5th. How were you able to finally date it? What were the, <laughs> what were the clues? Um, well, the return was somewhat easier because I knew what ship they were on, um, because I had another photograph from that trip of, you know, there'd be an onboard photographer on these, on these ships, and it said the name of the ship, it was the Queen Mary, but I didn't know what ship they had departed on, and ultimately, um, my aunt, who was then the only surviving member of that family, she was, uh, 91 years old, I think, when she moved out of her apartment, just came across an old envelope of postcards. And many of those postcards were sent during this trip. And one of them had the name of the ship. And so going through the records, I was able ultimately to, to find out the name of the ship and the date of the departure. So well, that was the kind of research that had to happen. It was these right. fragments, these scattered pieces that are, you know, in someone's closet or in a drawer or in someone's memory halfway across the world. And it was a question of just beginning to kind of piece together these fragments to make a story. Okay. Well, and Katarina and Bianca and Glenn, it sounds like you all functioned as detectives in some way using, um, you know, the, the barest scraps of history, right, in some ways to pull together uh, this extraordinary story. Um, and, it, it, you know, as we think about World War II and the Holocaust, um, of course, I think the point that you made earlier, Bianca, is that it's in color. And of course, mm -hmm. we see the past in black and white. So I think it's for audiences. Can you talk about some of the strategies that you used, um, both as, as a producer and director and Katerina as an editor, um, to help people connect 
uh, with this moment and with the people certainly featured in the film. Well, what for me was was important as well is at, at the beginning, um, just um, give it space, let it let it be on the screen for for a long time, so that you can you know drink in in the details. And funnily enough, I think Glenn has the same. We probably have both watched the film uh, thousands of times, and still every time you see it, you see a new detail that, oh, hey, that little part that happens uh, on the left hand side, um, I didn't really pay attention to before. So it's a kind of, becomes a kind of magical piece of film in that sense that never stops um, yielding. And that's also, um, yeah, makes you realize how um, superficial we normally look at things, what it, you can see here, what it can yield if you really uh, concentrate um, on one uh, piece of film and how much you can um, get from only that. And that was a very um, important uh, part for me. And the other thing is, of course, um, you're trying to, to find a lot of information, but you also have to deal with the fact that about some things there, is no information that is say i will not say lost forever because uh, still something can come up again but for the moment you cannot um we don't have more footage this is it so you have to it's very much in that sense a movie about presence and absence all the time in in very um different ways there are also a lot of strands of research that, that did not um, in the end uh, uh, gave us anything. For instance, I thought if I find a lip reader that can uh, lip read um, Yiddish or Polish that was spoken in around Warsaw in 1938, we might be able to see what you see clearly there are people speaking. We might hear what they are saying, but we finally found um, 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 lip read readers who could do that, but they all said, no, it's too fragmentary or too fake or too short. We cannot make out um, what they say. So then you think, okay, we have to convey that in a different way. And you think there must be words that, you know, that yeah. everybody always says in any um, situation. So then we thought, okay, let's use those words then in a a whole lot of different uh, languages. You can say America, Nashels, and boat, and things like that. Right. Words that pop up in any conversation. So, yeah, you all the time had to work with absence and presence, and what was really lost, and what you can maybe still find back. Well, and Katarina, you mentioned, uh, and as a as a film editor, usually you have so much that you're trying to pare down to make a kind of coherent film. And of course, this was in some ways really quite the opposite. Um, how did that challenge you and your work? Uh, it was um, uh, surprising because it was just three minutes, but we, I, I still have the feeling we didn't go, we could do even more <laughs> because, because I still, Till the last day of the, the editing, I, we, we discovered things. And every time you watch again, you discover things where the, the, someone is looking somewhere. What's he looking at? Oh, the other one is going there. There's so much happening. And when you really look at it, you can, you can really discover things for forever, I have the feeling. And maybe the fact that you know, uh, and it's, I think it's said in the film, um, that there's nothing left of some people but these images and that's that gives something very important to to the work and so you watch to it very differently right that's that's why you use some movements a few times to really be sure that people see what what this girl is doing or this woman is doing so well um, yeah. And what's so interesting, I think, about the film, and I think, Glenn, you allude to it at the beginning, 
uh, that it's uh, 1938, and of course we know what happens. So you're two months from Kristallnacht, right? Of course, which is a major turning point um, in European Jewish history, uh, and frankly in world history. But you're also almost exactly um, a year from the outbreak of World War II. Uh, so it really is this slice um, this moment in time where the people were watching on the screen and the stories that you're telling, um, we know and predict what can happen and what will happen to many of them. So there's a kind of haunting um, feeling uh, mm -hmm. to the film. So we have just a few more minutes um, as we close out the conversation. And I'd love to hear from all of you by identifying these people and the details of the life of this community through these three minutes, you really manage to restore their humanity um, and their individuality, which is, of course, one of the goals uh, that all historians and filmmakers and writers um, aspire to. Uh, I'm the AVP for Museums, Archives, and Rare Books at Kennesaw State University and oversee uh, World War II and Holocaust Museum. And our motto is meet history face to face. And that is absolutely the theme of this film. So could mm -hmm. you talk about, as we close uh, today, could you talk about the importance of uh, bringing the story uh, to the big screen and what it means for us as scholars and historians um, and viewers uh, who are interested in this period and, and certainly feel the weight of this history? I guess I'll start. Um, the first part of that is finding finding the people. Um, as I said at the beginning, I was always interested in these people as individuals, and it was always my goal to try and identify them by name with specificity, because I think that so often, especially in Holocaust stories, we make these generalizations and we tend to uh, feel it's sufficient somehow just to look at someone. Oh, they look just like us, therefore we know who they are. Or we know what's going to happen, therefore we know something about them. Um, but that's such a general sense, and it's, I think, in many ways not, not accurate. And what it misses is the, is the magnitude of what is lost when an individual mm -hmm. is lost, and the magnitude then of what is lost when an entire community is lost and an entire culture. And it was that that I really wanted to try and show. And I think you can only show that by showing how complex one person actually is. So I, I searched for survivors and ultimately um, through extraordinary coincidences and a lot of hard work, um, I, I met eight survivors still living, um, two of whom um, appear in the film as, as young people. Um, one of them, Mr. Chandler, um, is, is in Bianca's film. Right. Um, and the stories of the rest um, are, are in my book. Um, and it just, it was so important to me to, to honor them as individuals. And by honoring the few that we can identify, in a sense, I think we have a greater understanding of what was lost with the many that we can't identify. Right. Um, so that was really my goal. And I think the things that Katerina and Bianca have said show why I think it, we worked really well together and we were, I think it, it came, came together because I think that sensibility for really sort of dwelling on the complexity of each instant, each frame um, is something we share. Agreed. Bianca and Katerina, any last words as we close out our conversation? Yes, it was of course, Often, especially in memorials, they center around the, the names of, of people because often it is um, the last thing that is left from someone. And, but in this case, um, for most people, you see, we, we don't know um, their name. We have their face. So that is kind of like the last trace uh, in this case is, is what someone looked like. And... That also for me was very important to pay respect to these people for especially the children. You really have the feeling they want to be seen, maybe not necessarily by us, but they do want to be seen. They really try to look into the camera, to try to stay in the, in the frame. So that's why we, I thought of this, this sequence that every 
um, recognizable face, however blurry or fake, should have its own, let's say, uh, individual uh, portrait in the movie. That for me was a kind of, um, yeah, my paying respect to this um, uh, people that we see in the movie. Okay. It was very important for me. And Katarina, as, as sort of a last word, a goal uh, for the film, okay. recovery. Uh -huh. Uh, after working on this film, I feel like I feel attached and like I know these people mm -hmm. because I watched it so much that I I really like the images a lot, and I have a lot of details still staying in my head and and I I yeah, I feel kind of attachment, an attachment. That's what well, I want. And, and I think it's fair to say that the audience felt. Uh, that sense as well. The three minutes of lengthening is an extraordinary accomplishment, and we are so proud to have it as part of the Atlanta Jewish Film Festival for 2022. Uh, Glenn and Bianca and Katarina, we cannot thank you enough uh, for both your work on the film and its contribution, uh, but also for joining us for this conversation. It makes the film even richer. Uh, and uh, so with that, uh, we'll say goodbye, uh, but hopefully we'll find an arena in which to speak again as you work on your next project. But again, thank you so much uh, and to the audience for joining us this year. Um, stay safe, everybody, um, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.